Very excited to talk to these two. This world uh, that they've created is so much fun, but more importantly, I go way, way back with these two, and I am so proud of everything they've done, every step along the way, the growth. I mean, uh, just going into this film, the growth of how, how it looks and how you've kind of created your characters, every step of the way, I, I see it, and I, like I said, I get more proud every day. So, Ian Esham, welcome to uh, this interview right now, and uh, uh, congratulations on Fat Man. Derek, it's great to be here, man. Great to be here with you talking about talking about the film. Yeah, thanks for having us, man. Well, it, it is it is my pleasure, and you know, as I'm watching this, and as a fan, I got to say, uh, I was I was enjoying every step of the way, but also uh, there's there's some there's some Nelms Brothers uh, Easter eggs in here too that I've seen as well from from films as well as uh, a little convenience as well, let's just say. So there's there's some fun stuff that I definitely caught. So was <laughs> was that something you want to kind of do? Is you kind of want to bring things, you know, keep keep, keep them moving forward. I mean, we got to put some callbacks in there, you know, things that we enjoy. You know, we and I love a good uh, a menacing black hot rod. You know, got to get that. Seems like in almost every movie. And uh, yeah, the production designers and such would throw some some Easter eggs in there, like you said, some banners on some certain stores and such that would uh, <laughs> that would keep the, the eyes. For sure. And I was so uh, I, I was very interested to see this world that you created. So I guess um, you know, let let's start with that, uh, Ian. I guess can you tell us how you wanted to create this world with your Santa, because that's very important to this world, is how you wanted Santa to be seen and also interact with this reality you made. Yeah, I think uh, when we first start, when we came up with the idea, we wanted to ground Santa. The whole idea was what if, what if this guy was real? What if he really was a person? What would that entail? Wh where would he be today in this state of, uh, I, I guess, turmoil or, or, uh, malaise or i mean there's just you know joblessness there's a there's so many crazy social commentary things you can play with um as we were writing it it's just the world we were trying to create was something that that reflected somewhat uh of our world but with a real santa and uh the characters i mean we love we love uh having heightened characters that, that we sort of are able to ground um and put into real situations so that uh I don't know. It's so that it's more believable, I guess I'd say, but even though that uh, doesn't quite quantify what, <laughs> what, what this world is, but I think grounded was probably the best word that, that to describe it uh, because we would, we would always be saying it a little more grounded. Uh, well, that's a little too far, a little more grounded, a little more this, you know, it was, it was, that was usually the, the, the word that of the day was grounded. <laughs> and I see that a lot, too, because that seems like something that, you know, I mean, not only is he uh, dealing, you know, as Santa, but uh, the way that he's progressed through time, as well as uh, different, uh, you know, entities interacting with him in this world, too. Um, so, uh, you know, talking about that, too, uh, Esham, can you talk about how you wanted kids to realize Santa and how they thought of him as out there? Uh, well, the kids in the in the picture, or the kids of our actual world. Well, the the kids in the in the picture, like you know how how they perceive Santa as being an actual character out there, but also some way to kind of give them that uh, that that reach out, saying Santa is out there. Your letter does get to him, um, and uh, and and your your presence will come from Santa. You know, you have you have a little thing that says "Made in Santa's Workshop." Absolutely. I mean, for us uh, in this picture, Santa is real. He's, uh, you know, he's got a humble dwelling up there in Alaska, and uh, kids know this, the world knows this, but he's become a bit disenchanted, and, you know, as, as you may see, Billy, who gets a, you know, doesn't behave himself, gets a lump of coal, he blames Santa for his problems, and, you know, there's a bit of a, a, bit of a revenge story there. Yeah, I know one of the things that we came up with that you don't see on the screen is, is but I think you feel on the screen. I, it's not something that's said, but we, we came up with this rule that we wanted uh, kids that were sort of 12 and under to still be receiving presents and people that were older, you, you sort of age out of it. So we had to come up with these rules of like, okay, well, you know, it's not like a 35 year old man's going to be getting a, a Christmas present, but we wanted to make sure that kids received Christmas presents. And that sort of was what pushed them along in their lives. It didn't necessarily mean they were going to, if they got a fire truck, they were going to be firemen, but it did mean that they were, that that was sort of, you know, what they were leaning toward or uh, because at one point skinny man, you know, you realize he has a, a little cop car and you realize that he could have very well gone that way. 
um, especially with, you know, what his, what, what gets him excited. You know, he likes adrenaline. He likes to sort of get out there and get after it. Right. So I think kids see Santa in this world as more of like a um, guiding light. Yeah. Like a guiding light, uh, whatever your, whatever, whatever propensity you have, he'll sort of push you in that way, try to encourage you. He knows. Um, and then on the other side of it, you know, you don't have to go that way, but you know, you'd probably be better off if you did. Yeah, it was actually a lot of fun thinking about the world and the uh, the rules of Santa. Yeah. Right. So the cool thing about this is not only the story and how you created the world, but of course, Mel Gibson himself. So how how, how did he come about? Was he in your minds when you wrote this and how, how you wanted a, a Santa? Or did he kind of just become the image as soon as he signed on? And you're like, I can't see anyone else. I mean, for us, we, uh, we had, we'd gone to see uh, a screening of Hacksaw Ridge in L.A. And Mel was there. And he did the Q&A after the show. And honestly, when Ian and I saw him, he had a beautiful full beard. And uh, yeah, I think he was doing I think he was doing uh, Professor and the Madman next after that movie. So he had that Professor and the Madman beard, which is similar to what he has in this one, but a little bit different. But yes. Yeah. And just seeing him up there doing that Q&A, needing his beard, he felt like a man that had, uh, you know, the burden of the world on his shoulders. You know, and I, I mean, that's probably the effects of a show and the drain, you know, the drain. And he's in an Oscar campaign. And <laughs> uh, but, but that burden of him, uh, we and I just turned to each other and we said, that's the guy. Like, that's right. Chris. Well, and I guess when I was watching him too, I think about, you know, I try to, I try to liken back to the characters and then know who he is. And the sense of of his Santa and Chris and, you know, what is right in the world and what what needs to be correct like when I look at it, I almost think of his film Payback. Even though he was a criminal, he knows what's right and he knows what needs to happen. And so I felt like that was kind of the character when I was thinking of that, the way his character was in this film too. He has that kind of way about him. Like even though that guy was a criminal and this guy is, you know, jolly old say Nick, it still is something where he's like, this is what's right in the world and this is what needs to happen. So, uh, you know, when you first explained your Santa to him, and, and, and how you wanted him to kind of perceive him. Like, what was that t conversation? We probably had, I could, like the, the penultimate moment that I, I always remember when, when we were, when we sat across from him is we met at like a, a little cafe uh, in Malibu uh, to talk to him about it. And he, we started talking about the script and there was one moment where he said, you know, it's that scene where uh, Chris is over the balcony looking out at the elves and he like I, he's all you know the way you've written in the script i really feel like like the the way i should portray it is I, i'm almost about ready to cry like i should be almost ready to cry that it's affecting me this much and we were all yes yes and he's all and that's what's so funny about it and we're all exactly that's exactly what we're after like like you know playing it so real uh and it being such a goofy ass scenario <laughs> you're kind of like wow like this is a, we're all in on this you know um, which, which for some reason, uh, for us and hopefully other people is, is, uh, is entertaining, you know, They're just really trying to sell it, really trying to go for it. And I think it is. It's like bringing the, the grounded and real to the surreal. Yeah. Right. Well, and I'm sure, I mean, as directors, you have to talk to your actor and explain some things, but how did you go about broaching the conversation about how you want action to look to Mel Gibson? I mean, there's a guy who knows action way better than anyone else there, probably by far. And you're like, well, well, we want this gun to do this or this gun to do this. I mean, I'm sure he listens to you. But at the same time, this man has been holding guns longer than most of us have been alive, you know, and, and doing some crazy stuff with him. So how did that conversation go? I mean, you're absolutely right. I mean, you're sitting there, you know, you're trying to, to you're collaborating with Mel Gibson, directing Mel Gibson. Uh, that's a, that's, it's, a, it's mildly intimidating to say the least. This is a man who's, you know, clutched little gold trophies. Um, I think Ian and I went out there and all we do is we just did our thing, right? We didn't try to, we tried to put it out of our mind and just be like, okay, he's our collaborator. He's here to work with us and make the best picture possible. Um, Ian and I are very meticulous with our director photographer, Gianni Durango. And uh, we make storyboards. We go out there, we work with the, the stunt team and we get everything mapped out. And I think, you know, look, I, Mel, Mel watches, right? He, he, want, he's, you know, he's got eyes on everything. He'll wander up and ask you what lenses are on the cameras and things like that. I mean, this, this man's totally invested and he wants to know every minute detail. Um, and I, I think we were encouraged that he, that he was, he went along for the ride and seemed to have a blast. And uh, we're just really excited that it came together and we got to collaborate with him. Yeah. I think it was, I think it, I would say overall, like an all encompassing way to phrase that is that we really tried to prepare slash over prepare 
not not just because we were dealing with a man that you know probably knew our job better than us but that we were that that, that we always do that we always try to over prepare because you right. always want to you just want to put your best foot forward um you always wanted to be the best it could possibly be. So when he is asking those questions, what lens on the camera? What do you think for the next setup? Blah, blah, blah. You're just like, boom, 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 boom. Right. You've got all your answers ready. Um, and, the, and, and the one really cool thing about working with a guy like that is that we were constantly pumping him for answers about and <laughs> questions and stories. And I mean, we were just like, Remember, leave the weapon when uh, you did this and that. And it was great because he's so awesome. He's so forthcoming. And he would talk about, editing Braveheart and some of the tricks he did in there. Yeah, um, I remember like, like one of them was like, yeah. oh, I used a double frame here. And we were like, oh, double frame, yeah. And so we totally used that in the fight with Walton at the end. Like there's a double frame of the blade, like go chink and it like right. hang on a frame frames. I think, I, and I think, I think that that really kind of melding of the minds at times, you know, just that's where, that's where you make, that's where you get a step forward at times, you know, that's where you can really, you can really add to your game is when you're working with someone with so much experience. And again, all, all the way through it, he couldn't have been a better collaborator. He, he really was, you know, asking us questions and then trying to fulfill what we were after. He was, he was pretty amazing. And then if he had something to add or he had something he thought we should try, he would absolutely say it or he would say, um, you know, or, or we would start talking about a story and, and be like, well, maybe we should try something like that here or something like that. It was, it was, it was really a great experience. We had, we had such a great time. Of yeah, I, think, I, think I, remember, I remember there was a point I thought, a few days in and he was like hey guys you know can i see some footage and we're like oh where do you want to see that because he hadn't even asked us for footage yeah. and he was like yeah i'd love to see something and this i think this is the longest i've ever gone without seeing any footage of the sh of a movie i'm in and we're like, oh well, let's come over man let's show us some stuff yeah we felt like assholes but uh because we're just like oh man maybe we should have been like hey you know we're screening every night at whatever but yeah, but and he and i are digging in the footage every night and we're doing right like, you know and, but it was like oh let's come over and honestly like we sat down we had some popcorn we watched some dailies and, uh, and he got really stoked and he was like, yes, he got excited. Yeah, that's cool. I mean, I'm going to say this guy is, of course, you know, a penultimate actor, but also a director too. I mean, you were talking about Hacksaw Ridge. You're talking about some of the things he's created um, and, and, and you know, characters who were so memorable too. So it's not only to see how he wants himself to be seen, but also the character as well. So it's heartening to, to hear that, you know, especially from – uh, an actor who's been around so much to care about the craft so much, the dailies, you know, which I'm sure there's a lot of actors out there who care less about the dailies. They just show up, they deliver, and they're like, well, it's up to editing and them now. But to care every step of the way is is a big deal right now, too. Uh, and I, I'm, I'm sure that that's something that uh, they really kind of gave you guys that, that moment, which I always kind of ask directors, too. Like, what was the moment when you were on set or a specific time when you just kind of still smile about thinking about it because it was such a good moment. You're like, we've got something. It's gold. Everything's great. I mean, I don't know if it's the same moment for both of you or maybe even it wasn't on camera. Do you, do you remember any moment where you're just like, this is amazing. This is, this is so, so good. Like you were just so excited. I remember mine. It was, uh, I mean, there were a lot of them, honestly. Yeah. We've had this script for quite a while, for 14 years, maybe even a little longer. Um, but we probably started going out with it really hard about 14 years ago. And so it's been something that's been in our heads for a very long time. Um, and we've been looking to execute it th that entire 14 years. It wasn't like, oh, hey, this script, maybe. It was like, we're like, hey, we really want to do this next. And it was for 14 years we've been saying that. Yeah, so, like, oh, you know, someday you guys will get to make this. Yeah, exactly. So there, were, there was one in particular, though. There's a, there's a set of lines right before they start the shootout uh, where he says, you know, you think I got the job before I, because I'm fat and jolly. Like you think I'm the only one. And those lines, we were jonesing so hard to see those lines out of his mouth. That was probably the moment that I remember sort of, you know, coming up behind Eshin and Johnny and like grabbing them around the shoulders and being like, oh, you fucking believe me? It was so much fun. I, I, and I, you know, look, there's countless moments for me as well, but I just remember one, and this is a, this is a weird moment, right? I think it's it's the perspective of other people on the show. We were I walked in to get a hot tea or something, and in uh, the, the craft okay. over there, and the woman said, "You know, it's amazing when I'm listening to the walkie, and it's like, hey, can the uh, can the elves in the military come to set, please? The elves in the military come to set. <laughs> Santa <laughs> is ready. <laughs> it's, it's ready. It's like, 
even imagine what like the world would think of this intercom chatter. Well, and that's uh, that that's the beauty of it too, because you know, bringing that that realism to everything as well uh, was just so much fun as well. And like you were talking about how how you how you grounded it into the real world, which is something that I would look at it too. I mean, this is a Santa who understands that there are businesses out there. There's outsourcing. There's corporations. But there's a, a job he has too, uh, which I think is is amazing. You know, I finding him and then your Mrs. Claus too, like just both them together uh, had this real timeless quality about them too. Uh, that the world changes, but you know there is good and there is evil, um, and they they kind of you know have that too. Um, with your with your Santa, uh, what was your rules about how you wanted him to be perceived in? I guess almost in a in a godly state or in a cherished state, you know, because there's a lot of ways you could have gone. You could have made it, you know, he every time he, you know, twinkles his nose, something happens, or every time he does this. But I mean at the same time, Santa's picking up a gun and practicing and, you know, shooting as well. So it's not exactly like he's, you know, controlling the forces of nature. So where was that talk you had between you two where you're like, this is how we're gonna ground Santa, not only in how he reacts in reality, but also the powers he has. I think, I think for us, the first thing we approached it with was like, he's an everyman, right? That's our number one goal. It's like, okay, let's take an ordinary person and put him in extraordinary circumstances. Um, and then as far as his sort of like his tool set or his, his gifts, I mean, you know, like, you know what, they should be subtle and they shouldn't be, you know, so as, as, as flashy and garish as we've seen in some of the previous incarnations of this character. So for us, we wanted to underplay all of that, you know, like you get a glimpse of the sleigh. For us, we we're like, we can't have these, these grandiose things showing because then you just like the whole mystery starts to unravel, right? That's there's a reason we intentionally didn't show deer flying or him de actually delivering toys because it's like, if you actually wrap your brain around that, it's like Santa's gonna go deliver to 340 million houses in the US alone, like that's insane. That doesn't even make sense. So for us, it was like, hey, let's keep it grounded. Let's not dig into that too much and just give him enough to be dangerous. Yeah, it was a real balance of us trying to find, like, I'd say it, all, the, all that happens in the writing, you know, as we're trying to figure out how much we want to show, how much, are, how much am I going to feel is believable, especially when we're trying to ground this, like, fantastical, crazy world. Right. Um, but, but there also was a sense of, you know, he, he is an everyman, he is a blue-collar guy, he, is, he, he does have this, you know, warehouse or workshop that you kind of want to say, he's an everyman, he's, he's, he's just like everybody else, he's dealing with, you know, he's dealing with budget problems, he's dealing with, uh, you know, how, to, how is he going to keep his workers employed, um, and there was a, um, shit, I lost track of my, my track of my thought. Sorry, but I think, I think I'll find it in a second, but go. That's right. I mean, I think one thing that's pretty interesting for us is that while we had written the script several years ago and we continued to revise it every single year, but it, as the years went along, the script became more relevant. I mean, who would have thought that we would find ourselves here in a pandemic with unemployment skyrocketing and all yeah, the hurdles right. that every family has across the world right now? I mean, it was, it was, it was alarming to us, you know? Yeah, right. I, know, I know where it's going, sorry. Um, so... I, I, we, we wanted to give this sense, even though he's an everyman, that, that obviously there's this bigger world, this, this sort of, you know, $3 trillion industry that he's a part of. And that's really what it's all become. It's all become this like numbers game on spreadsheets. And so when the government and the military come to him, there's kind of a lack of respect. You know, they don't really have a respect for his magic and his holiday. They're just kind of like, well, hey, we don't really have to go to these, you know, these other countries to get this work done now because you know, Santa's labor force can actually get it done cheaper or can actually get right. it done faster or, or both. Um, and like, they're nice about it. They're kind of like, Hey, you know, we understand you're Santa and God, I'm really sorry, Chris, but the contract you signed uh, doesn't quite fit what you, what you think it does. Like, you know, we kind of have you over a barrel. Sorry, man. Um, and Chris is old school, right? He's yeah. a man of like, handshakes and moral integrity and, mm -hmm. and of your word you and, know? and but but these people are, are a world this is a world of contracts and uh mm -hmm. you know and he signed one that wasn't wasn't great and it continues mm -hmm. you know as the rising number of naughty you know starts to build like he's it, it becomes perpetual that he's just going to go out of business because he can't he does his his uh didn't read the fine print yeah his, his, right. uh, his money's going away and he, he can't make he can't make enough toys well, the cool thing is you do have elves and you do have Santa 
who kind of he he knows every kid out there, every name, every person. He understands the soul of who they are too, and he kind of just it just kind of pops into his head. So that's kind of a fun thing about the character too. But moving over to the other side. You know, the meticulous killer that is Walton, you know, when you were talking about that character and meticulous and his nature, uh, how did you first uh, talk to him about that? Well, let's just start with Walton Goggins is a, a force of nature. Yes. I mean, the man comes, he utterly and completely dives into a character. And, you know, you're, as, as, a, as the directors, we're just hoping to hold on and capture as much of that as we can on camera. Um, yeah, he really is. He really is a driving force. It's really fun. You sort of, the process with him, for us anyway, was Walton reads the script. He likes the script. Thank goodness. Awesome. We're excited to work with him because he's fucking amazing. And then you talk to him. He asks you a ton of questions. And while he's asking you those questions, he's building in his head his character. And when he shows up to set, he's 90% there all the time. And that and, and you know, and then he's a hundred and a hundred and ten percent that on 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 screen. And even when we would be you know, in between takes, we're like, hey, Walton, you're, we're talking to him as Walton or in not in a character mode. He would still answer us in the voice of Skinny Man. Which is amazing. Which is amazing. Uh, and he would spend most of his time in the, at least in, you know, in, in a state of flux of Skinny Man. He would never really drift all the way out and like, and he would be talking about other things as Walton, as, as, as himself about all these things. But there were all these little mannerisms and characteristics that he'd sort of embedded himself uh, from the character that he would have all the way throughout the shoot. And then like, you know, we've talked to him afterward or seen him afterward. And he's just, he, he's, he's a little different than he was when he was on set because he doesn't have all those mannerisms sort of ingrained in him. Uh, so he's just that guy, man. He just brings everything with him. And it was a lot of fun to collaborate with him because he is the character living and breathing in front of you. And you can just have a quick discussion with him. And he's, he's got his head wrapped around what that guy is going to do. Right. Well, and there's uh there was a lot of humor found in that character too, because his world is so set up within it. Whenever anyone kind of encroached upon it, he just kind of uh I, I guess the best way is put it, he he kind of set his personality upon them. And so they they changed or they broke one way or the other. So that's one thing I really loved about that character too. Uh well, I, I gotta say, you know, I'm so excited for this. I I I want uh I, I want to see more about this world. I want to see more about the fat man. I want to see more about what else is a possibility. Like, I, I, want, I want a sequel is what I want. I want to see like what else is out there. Is there like a tooth fairy that's actually like a dentist on the side? Or is there like other people who are like living in the real world or something? Or I want, I want Santa to go to war. I don't know. I think he'd be badass, of course, with Mel Gibson. Anything with war is probably amazing. So, uh, but Batman is is a ton of fun. It's a great story. And more importantly, I think people are going to find it in a, a bunch of different ways, too. Because even though it is Santa, it's not necessarily a Christmas movie. I mean, Christmas plays a part because it is Santa, but it is kind of a timely, any time of the year kind of film, right? Yeah. Look, we hope so, right? That's what that's the goal, right? Was to, was to put this very human story on a Christmas backdrop and then throw a little splash of action in there. Yeah. I mean, we we totally were trying to make a movie that we were excited about. And I remember there's, I remember when, when we were teenagers uh, and it probably the, the, the trailer I got most excited about at, when I was 13 or 14 was army of darkness. And it was just because <laughs> I remember that trailer coming up on like a, another movie that I'd rented. And I remember Eshram and I watching it and we were just flabbergasted at, the storytelling and like what that trailer was saying it was going to be about. We just got as giddy as like you could even, as you could imagine because of the premise, it was like a, a crazy ass premise that you would just think of that you wouldn't think would be able to be turned into a movie for one reason or another, but there it was. Um, and that was certainly kind of the excitement that we had going into this, that we were trying to create, you know? Yeah. And that's funny too, because I I've talked to many older actors, some amazing, huge actors and I tell them about my childhood and I tell them, you know, the reason I love you or the things that happen are because when I was a kid, I got a VHS tape. And when you get one VHS tape, you watch that VHS tape over and over and over again. I mean, we probably watched a, a bunch of those movies together where you're like, OK, let's just start that one over because we don't have anything else. Or we got this rental for another day. Let's watch it again. And I, Or you have a you know, recording stuff from HBO onto a VHS tape and that tape gets played over and over again. So the, the kids today don't understand the uh, 
the, the plethora of content that comes into their world that we just didn't have. So we got to be meticulous about these films and these characters and these actors. Uh, of course, uh, Mel is one of those people uh, in Army of Darkness. I mean, you, you look at Bruce, you look at, uh, you know, Raimi, what he did with everything there, too. The humor in it. Uh, it's just amazing and, and how much that carries on to who you are today. So uh, I, I hope that this uh, this film uh, gets a huge audience, but also I hope I want to get that that equal opportunity to be cult status too, because that's always the fun part. When you get people who get the cult status who can also say, okay, well, I'm going to keep on with this film no matter how long the years go through. So I, I, I wish both of those sides of the coin to both of you. Uh, I think everyone should go check out this film ASAP. And I think they're going to really, really enjoy this. Uh, Mel just gives an amazing uh, gritty performance. Like he's, he's very real, but he also has that, darker Mel Gibson where you know you know if this Santa was real he would kick your ass into being good or else you're going to be naughty for for real so watch out yeah that was one of the things I remember when we were when we were putting that one of the I, I don't know if, if this will come out before people have had a chance to watch it probably no matter, no matter it's what coming out before dying. yeah so in one of those end scenes when he's when he when he sort of has that moment with with uh with got it with billy basically you know yeah. there's there's there was just a chance. moment of you know with chance you just there's just a moment of uh of like you said santa will kick your ass uh that we were certainly that old school vibe in there because i mean this guy's hundreds if not thousands of years old so we, right. we definitely wanted that vibe of like there were all those myths right of of back in the day of like the norwegian santa who would snatch the children and i mean we just want we were having a little bit of fun kind of leaning into some of those old myths about santa or krampus or you know that even that character being the same person right um, oh that'd be interesting know, even though we're just giving nods to that sort of darker side even though this is a pretty dark tale there are darker versions where he's snatching children that are bad and they're not coming <laughs> back um we wanted to sort of give a nod to those those darker pasts uh that we thought were pretty awesome I think she was amazing. I think she is, she is the grounding force, right? She is, she is the yeah. heart and, and, you know, even, even the darkness that's in him, like she understands that, which I think is the beauty of it as well, because the, the good uh, and evil Wayne is definitely something that she's there. She's the one who ups tips the scale as well. So tell, tell us about your, your, your Mrs. Claus, you know, how did you want her to be perceived, you know, when you have a, a Santa like this and also how she reacts to him, his world, uh, his decisions. I mean, first of all, we were absolutely thrilled to get Marianne. She's such a tremendous actor and it really excited Ian and I to have a woman of color. And honestly, like we were thrilled with her British accent. <laughs> like it gave it an inner quality that we were uh, that Mel Ian and I were all just so stoked about. Yeah, I remember she when we when she first was excited about coming on, she was like, "Okay, how do you want me to do this? You know, it doesn't say in the script. Do you want me to be standard American? Do you want me to be regional? What do you want to pick a state? What do you want me to do?" And we were like, "No, no, no, keep your your British accent." And she's like, "Ooh, okay, I like that." And we're like, "All right, awesome." She's like, "Yeah, that's really cool." As she thought, as we sat there and just you know got really excited with her about what that choice was going to do to that character and how it was going to influence Chris and what it says about their relationship and when they met or how they met or it just really kind of layers up their, their past and how they met and it, it, their background together. And you're just like, wow, what is that? How did that come together? And, you know, it, it's, it's, it adds such a cool layer for us. Um, yeah. But she was, she was just, a, she's just an amazing actress. And we couldn't, we, was what we were really hoping to get was somebody that could really chew up that role. And she adds such gravitas to Mel's, to, to, to Mel's yang. You know, she's that yin to his yang. You get to see her, like anytime he gets down, you get to see her strategically start to figure out, okay, the spirit of Christmas is waning. How do I get this guy back up? How do I fix this situation? Right. And, and not just in, a, in any kind of weird kind of subservient way, it's more of like he's the puppet, she's the master, she's the one that's sort of, you know, organizing everything. She has all the logistics down. She keeps him up. She keeps him moving. Uh, yeah, she's really the. We felt like she was such a driving force, a real spine behind his operation and him as a person. I mean, every time they were, yeah, anytime they were working together on set, it was just so exciting for us because honestly, we were thrilled with their chemistry. They had amazing yeah, chemistry, great. and all those scenes for us just crackled. I mean, we couldn't right. wait to shoot them, and they would all these funny well, she, little uh, improvs in. She's the base. I mean, she's like the the military wife. 
Like she makes sure everything is good and steady at the home. That's what she does. He'll go off to war. He'll do what he needs to do. And, you know, he'll bring rightness to the world. But she's the base to make sure that she not only takes care of him, but everything else that needs to happen on the home front. Uh, because, you know, she she helps reload him, you know, helps helps kind of save his, his his sanity and everything else, too. But also she shows um, the the circle of magic that comes with him as well. Because they they grow together and they have this ability that um, I, I guess you know you kind of guys explain. I don't want to give anything away about how uh, they give uh, you know how he has his magic. You know what provides him his magic. What provides him those things. And I think she is a thing that kind of uh, she has her own way of, of uh, grabbing her own magic and 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 um, creating the world that they need to survive in to keep moving forward through time. And so that's one thing I really did enjoy as well. You know, it's not just baking cookies with a smile, but it's also, you know, the, the back of the hand when someone's doing something bad or or even yeah. Santa needs a little slap here or there just to kind of get him back into the right the right look, I guess, the, the right vision, I guess. No, yeah. you just nailed it right there, man. She keeps them tethered. She knows when to dish out the tough, the tough love or when to be cuddly. And, 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 and yeah, I mean, she... She really is everything for him to lean on if he's not if he's not up to par. Like they couldn't do this without each other. You know, it's just you. you I, I feel like you get that vibe, which is which is really exciting. I didn't want to give too much about him away, but that's one of the things that I, I did enjoy too, and that's something that um, I almost want to see more of and talk about because I want people to realize that this this little shit, to put it into better terms. You know, it it is the rich taking, uh, you know, t- taking over, thinking that they deserve something, and so um, Santa is the everyday, and then Chance is the uh, the one percent, uh, trying to say if this isn't right, then this shouldn't exist. So that's something that I really did enjoy too. He is a great evil little kid, which I I am not a big fan of evil little kids because what I mean, what can you do to an evil little kid? I mean, that's my always my issue with horror movies too. Like if you have an evil little kid, so let's say I kill the evil kid, I'm going to jail. No one's going to believe me there was a demon, that little kid. No one's going to believe that little kid was evil. I'm going to jail for the rest of my life because I killed a kid or something went wrong. So there's always that balance of, you know, even if the, the kid is like just pure black evil, you need to have something where you're like, well, there's a, a spanking needs to happen, but a lesson yeah. needs to be learned too. No, I'm, you're absolutely right. Man. It's funny because like, we, when we uh, when we got Chance's audition tape, I mean, we were just blown away because he really was channeling this evil little snot and Billy. And, and he and I turned to each other and we said, "Wow, he's really good at this. Um, I hope I wait, let's talk to him because if that's his, it, you know, is he acting here? Like, what is this?" And so when we got on this the the video conference call with him, he was the sweetest kid, such a nice kid. And we were like, "Oh, thank goodness. Okay, let's yeah. get him over here." <laughs> Yeah, we could have it could have gone bad real quick in our minds because he was so good at it. We thought, oh, this must be how you know that this is a, a pretty predominant side of him and that we were gonna get a lot of that on set. And it just as a person, it it couldn't have been further from the truth. He couldn't have been a more like smart, sweet, professional, professional kid. And man, he's I mean, as young as he is, I think he's been working since he was five. So I mean, he's been in the he's been in the business, you know, longer than he's been alive. So <laughs> It's. I mean, he's he he's a really talented kid, and uh, we couldn't say enough about him or his performance. He really, we really felt he brought it, especially since the type of kid that he is 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 the exact opposite of what that character is, and and he sells the shit out of it, man. Yeah, and we also right. wanted to give Billy. You know, Billy could just be a one dimensional bad kid, right? But for us, we wanted to layer his character with a little bit more, a little bit more baggage, so you at least know why he's acting the way he is, right? He's a product of neglect, of overindulgence. And he's acting out. Yeah, we didn't want to just say, "Hey, this kid's got money. He's a real turd." <laughs> we wanted to say, right. "Hey, this kid's got money. He's been neglected. He's got, you know, the, the the person there to watch him. His grandmother is ailing. She can't quite keep up with him. She doesn't know what he's doing, and he's manipulating the hell out of her uh, to get what he wants and needs. And obviously, treating the staff like hell. Um, right. so, so, yeah." Well, that's the thing. I mean, because he, he is the one who actually, I think, opens up the world the most, not just Santa and how you define him, but the way that he defines what good or evil is for him. And that 
that's the reverberations to Walton's character, to Mel's character, to everyone else, is how he defines what's right or wrong in his world. And those things kind of just, like I said, echo off of everybody else. Because like I said, if he was just a one-dimensional little character, you wouldn't see him as the evil, you know, antithesis to, to everything else too. You would just see him as a little snot who's playing around. I mean, in the same way that like the kid from the toy, like you saw him and how evil he was when he first started with that, or some of these kids who are just, you know, that kind of way. But there, if you have a better character, they open up and they have, they help everyone else open up too, because by them being evil enough and coherent enough, then you can have people who are bigger than and, and you know, who have to fight this wave of, of money and anger because kids at that age don't know what's right or wrong. They just know what they want. And that's one of the evilest things out there. So that's <laughs> that's one of the problems you, ha you have right there at that little age is when they want something, want is way more important than what's right or wrong. So I think that's something that very much comes across with him, too. Awesome. And you, uh, that mentality may not be limited to little kids. <laughs> That's true. That's true. No, and I, I, I don't want to get into to too much and pointing names, uh, pointing fingers at, at people that that's like, but yeah, no, I understand that very much, but it's, there's definitely times when I, I I've seen some kids where I'm like, all right, well, they're just, they don't know any better. And that's, that's really where that term comes in. You don't know any better at that time. You don't know that you're not supposed to break it. You don't know you're not supposed to yell in the middle of a mall. You don't know you're not supposed to do these things because you're not an adult yet. At a certain point you go, well, I should probably not do this and not be a little shit about things. Um, but you know what? That's, that's a different uh, uh, conversation that's going to happen with parents on good housekeeping or something like that. Like that's not, that's not where we are right now. So um, is there anyone, anything else you guys wanted to touch on before we moved on? That was perfect, man. Perfect. All right, cool. Well, let me close up here. All right. So, well, I want to say the, the best part about all this is just the fact that this story is just so much fun. And like I said, I am so excited for people to watch this. Um, all, all the characters are, are just so much fun and, and have so many dimensions to them. And then this world as well is not as um, easy bake as you would think it would be. I mean, you watch a trailer and you're like, I think I know what this is. I know, I think I know who these people are, but there's so much more than that. I mean, Walton, um, Marianne, um, you know, and, and Mel and all these people together kind of make this into uh, an amazing story that is more than the holidays. And um, it's just action and fun, which I think is cool too. You know, getting, getting to see an angry Mel Gibson as Santa shooting some guns is probably a pretty fun thing. Like that's, that's gotta be on some weird fans, you know, wish list of things again to see that happen. Uh, and more importantly, like even, even as I watch it and I'm so content with the film, like I said, I want to see more of angry war Santa. Like, I just feel like that that's something out there that one thing angry war Santa, when he goes to war, you better watch out. Or, you know, in, in the war of 1918, like he, you, most people don't know he destroyed a, you know, a small German Nazi village or something like that by itself. So there's, there's definitely something out there for that. Uh, but yeah, I, I, I'm very excited about it. And like I said, I want everyone to watch this. So thank you again. You guys did an amazing job and I, I hope it, it was as fun to make as it is to watch. It totally was. It Absolutely. Was. Yeah. Thank you so much, Derek. Thanks. Derek. It, brother.